Those pushing the transgender mantra would have us believe that the trans movement well, is something that is looking out for the best interest of vulnerable, gender-confused minors, and that it guards against any exploitation of such young people. Well, is that really true? Is this movement a movement of protection and support for such vulnerable young people? Or is there a very different kind of agenda playing out right before our very eyes? One that uses such vulnerable kids for financial gain and sexual predation? Alex Aaron, founder of The Gender Mapping Project and co-founder of Partners for Ethical Care, pulls back the curtain on the reality of the transgender medical industry and those influences that are helping to groom such vulnerable youth towards sterilization and amputation. And, uh, and what we do is we call gender clinics. We pick up the phone to the clinics and we call up. We make up a BS story um, and we find out exactly what services they are willing to do. And we've been pushing the boat out recently on a lot of these surgeries. Um, it, you know, two or three months ago, if you would have said to me, Alex, I believe they're doing gender nullification surgery on, on teenagers, I would have, you know, really not believed you. I would have thought, mm, this sounds a bit too wild. But I've located four places who will perform gender nullification, which is the, um, in, uh, it, okay, so imagine a Ken doll or a Barbie doll, how it doesn't have anything down there it's just smooth that's the procedure that is being offered gender nullification or non-binary surgeries however you want to cut it up quite literally cut it up um i was able to get a referral for a 17 year old i mean that's that's it's it's so i it's so shocking and i i didn't think i could be shocked anymore We'll hear from Alex next on the Predator Watch podcast. Predator Watch finds a brief overview of important stories in the news or issues of concern as they relate to understanding the nature of sexual predators, their characteristics, how their minds operate, their methods of manipulation, and what motivates them. They hide in plain sight, can smell an opportunity a mile away, and count on people not understanding just how dark their hearts are and how intent they are about always producing victims. Stay tuned as John Euler, a licensed professional counselor with over 25 years of professional experience treating both survivors and sexual predators, shares his insights on this edition of Predator Watch. I am John Euler and welcome to Predator Watch podcast. On the other side of the screen, on the other line is Alex Aaron. Alex, did I pronounce your last name properly? That's great, Aaron. Yeah. Aaron. And uh, she is a wealth of information. I often reference the guests that I have as that because they each are a wealth of information in their own right. Um, Alex, you and I have been interacting online over the course of a year or so. You came to my attention because of your involvement in the gender mapping project. But as you and I have begun to interact, we have so many things in terms of our own passion and what really uh, lights our fire, so to speak, as far as our concerns mm -hmm. for women and children. And mm -hmm. so I'm just going to throw you a bunch of what are probably going to be softballs we're going to talk about a lot of different topics. We're going to have our, our viewers and listeners kind of buckle their seatbelts because we're going to do a deep dive. Probably very few people are going to become or have been made aware of what we're going to talk about as far as the trans movement. I call it the trans deception and the different things that uh, almost like tentacles. Really, what is uh, what are some of the main players and and the main sources of um, what's driving these different movements. And you are passionate about a number of different things that I'm passionate about, including mm. the surrogacy trade, which I'm a little late in the game with that. 
So I'm going to open it up uh, for a lot of different things, but why don't we first talk about, tell us about the gender mapping project. Sure. So the Gender Mapping Project is a project that was started around a year ago, and it was really to get a visual idea about how many pediatric gender clinics there were or there are in the world. Um, we started out the project in North America, and over the course of six months, we actually targeted, or rather we identified 300 pediatric gender clinics in North America. That's a staggering number. In, two sorry, in 2014, there were 60 gender clinics for children. Now that's horrifying enough, um, but to see that level of increase in just a couple of years has been quite staggering. Uh, the numbers for the adult clinics uh, so that's the adult and the adolescent and the children. It's topping at around a thousand. The vast majority of the dispensaries of these wrong sex hormones are run through networks of Planned Parenthoods. Um, you know, I don't need to tell you about Planned Parenthood's eugenics roots. Um, you know, they're, why, don't, they're, why don't you tell our audience because this mm -hmm. is something that I uh, speak about a lot. But it's worth, mm -hmm. again, I don't think we can ever repeat it enough. So mm -hmm. uh, help people understand yeah. the importance of what you just said as far as Margaret Sanger and her mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Margaret Sanger is, uh, was a deeply troubled individual um, uh, with a network of um, you know, a various kind of horrific ideas. Um, she was part of the eugenics movement. Uh, which believed that certain people, mainly certain people with um, uh, disabilities, um, definitely she did not think that black people should reproduce. Uh, and she started out, I believe the first organization was in, 19, in uh, 1920s. Um, yeah, and eventually went on to establish Planned Parenthood. Um, where, with the precise... Um, uh, target of uh, reducing the population of undesirables, as she, you know, defined them. So Planned Parenthood comes from murky waters. Um, now we, I, I, I mean, I am so deeply entrenched in Planned Parenthood at this point. I've attended so many of their webinars, their internal webinars that they're doing, um, and despite the fact that the their industry of abortion is now um, moving to the RU486 model. Uh, so the RU486 model is uh, moving away from what one would term a surgical abortion, which is the regular um, uh, dilation and suction, where a woman is put under and, and then has an actual surgical procedure. Uh, to Planned Parenthood is now moving towards the RU486 model, uh, which um, is the, uh, the, the dangerous um, poison pill. And this has been recorded really since like the 1990s, uh, where Janice Raymond, who is someone who is, you know, really close to my, you know, a massive inspiration for me, she wrote The Transsexual Empire, she also wrote kind of this expose uh, criticizing the RU40, the RU486 pill back in the 1990s. And nothing really has changed uh, in terms of Planned Parenthood, apart from in 2014, uh, the, 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 co the founder of Tumblr, which is a social media uh, website, which is kind of like the source of uh, illness amongst teenage girls, right? They have uh, so-called quarantined um, communities inside of Tumblr. One of them was Thinspiration, where girls were being exposed to material which, which actually made them anorexic. Uh, so now many young girls are either being groomed on Tumblr or they are, um, you know, becoming ill as a result of being exposed to Tumblr. So Tumblr is a bad place. But in 2014, um, David Karf, the founder of Tumblr, joined the board of Planned Parenthood, 
very interesting why he would do that. Um, and then the informed consent model for Planned Parenthood was born. The informed consent model means that you or I or anyone off the street can wander into a Planned Parenthood and demand um, cross-sex hormones. Maybe this is just me. Um, but I mean, I mean, of course, hindsight, because I mean, back when I wanted to take hormones, I mean, I thought Planned Parenthood, oh my God, this is like a godsend. I mean, I don't have to go because I didn't want to talk to a therapist. Um, I mean, so I, I don't have to jump through any hoops. I don't have to do anything. Um, I just walked in and got it. And yes, that's on me for not knowing what I wanted to do. But I also feel like if it wasn't just as easy as just walking in and signing a form for something that permanently changes your body for essentially the rest of your life in, in some aspects, um, I think like if it wouldn't have been so easy for me to just walk in, I don't think I probably would have transitioned because I think the longer I would have thought about it and given it more time to think and given it more consideration, I think, I think it may have played a pact or a part and may have influenced me transitioning at all. Um, if it just wasn't so easy, just a willy nilly on impulse, just go and decide to take hormones. Uh, so this is what we've discovered as part of the gender mapping project. And we've expanded to places um, such, you know, we've expanded, of course, to Canada. Uh, we've expanded very much um, into Switzerland, ex expanded into uh, Australia. We've got a very big team in Australia exposing the industry there as well. Um, and during the course of that, we have discovered all manner of really just unspeakable things, things that, in a, you know, if you would have told me three years ago that I would be talking about glitter moms and, you know, uh, envy phobia and cis washing and dysphoric females on OnlyFans, I would have thought you were talking a foreign language. I really, I would have, I would have thought you were from another planet or a crazy person, but now all of these pieces has fall, have fallen into place because of the gender mapping project. How do people access the gender mapping project? Mm -hmm. So they can go online to the gendermapper.org um, and they can actually see the interactive map and take, they can see the map in its entirety um, and they can see the name of every single clinic, which we are, you know, which we know is operating in the world. Um, and when one looks at this map, this interactive map, it, it, it's actually breathtaking. It really is a visual um, that it, it stays with you. So the, the actual map itself has become um, my logo, because all I say to people is I say, go to the gender mapping project, go to name and shame doctors and take a look at this map for yourself. And you tell me why there's 300 gender clinics, you know, um, many of whom are performing surgeries on children who cannot consent. Tell me why this is going on. I'd love to know. I have theories, but I don't have I want to know how this has happened on our watch and in front of us. And that's a crucial point to make, because if you're looking at stats, your stats are only as good as the source. And if people are perpetrating what amount to crimes, mm. right? If, if physicians are operating on minors without parental mm -hmm. consent, depending upon mm -hmm. the age, they're perpetrating a mm. crime. A child cannot consent, and therefore, uh, to try to get accurate information from mm -hmm. those that are performing these surgeries, you're never going to, they're not going to out themselves. And so that's why your project is so crucial. And if somebody happens to have additional information to add, how can they get a hold of you to fill you in yeah. on, additional, on an additional site? 
So all they need, I mean, we, I get, uh, sadly, I get testimonies every day, um, you know, so we're, we're adding to the site constantly. I have a team uh, that's working, uh, I have a team of volunteers that's, that's operating um, in various parts of the world. We've got a very strong presence in North, you know, very strong presence in the States very strong presence in Canada. And what we do is we call gender clinics. We pick up the phone to the clinics and we call up, we make up a BS story um, and we find out exactly what services they are willing to do. And we've been pushing the boat out recently on a lot of these surgeries. Um, You know, two or three months ago, if you would have said to me, Alex, I believe they're doing gender nullification surgery on, on teenagers. I would have, you know, really not believed you. I would have thought, mm, this sounds a bit too wild. But I've located four places who will perform gender nullification, which is the, um, in, uh, it, okay, so imagine a Ken doll or a Barbie doll, how it doesn't have anything down there it's just smooth that's the procedure that is being offered gender nullification or non-binary surgeries however you want to cut it up quite literally cut it up um i was able to get a referral for 17 year olds i mean that's that's it's it's so i it's so shocking and I, I didn't think I could be shocked anymore. Okay, so let me ask, since you're actually filling me in on this for the first time that I've heard this, I can picture castration, so they castrate a boy. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell me, what do they do to girls? Okay, so the gender nullification, um, I mean, I I don't know, have you ever managed to see, um, uh, not managed to see, have you ever been misfortunate enough to see um, FGM? A little you know, bit as far as the mutilation. Yeah, as far as the uh, oh, mm. okay. Well, good. Define that. Yes, I am. But now, go ahead and tell the audience what this is, and keep going with this. All right, sure. So, if you go on to a couple of these places that perform these surgeries, um, I'll just mention one called Align Surgical Associates. So they perform. Let me just read out to you this list of surgeries. Nullification, archaeectomy, which is rem- removal of the testicles, penectomy, phallus preserving vaginoplasty. So that means you can have, um, you can keep your penis and they will drill a hole into you for a um, receptacle for penetration. Um, a, a, a vagina preserving phalloplasty. So that means they will keep the hole and um, make a neophallus. Um, and non-binary top surgery, which for anybody who does not speak this crazy crank language, that means that they will remove the chest, they will remove the breasts, but they will um, not reattach the nipples, okay? So in terms of the nullification, um, let me just read out to you what they promise. Uh, if anybody's triggered, by the way, by any of this, like, please click away now because it's only going to get worse. <laughs> um, so nullification creates a relatively continuous and mostly unbroken transition from the abdomen down to the genital area, enabling gender non-conforming patients to enjoy a body that looks closer on the outside to the way they feel on the inside. Um, and what this procedure um, is is promising to do, so it does a variety of different things. So um, I'm I'm really trying not to be revolting here. Um, Go ahead and be revolting. We need to hear it. We need to hear it. <laughs> right. hey, listen, if somebody shies away from this, they don't care about mm. kids. Bottom mm-hmm. line. Yeah. Right. If if somebody has to hide. The nature of the procedure, such as, isn't it interesting? That's what cults do. Cults change the language. We have to mm-hmm. let people understand so they get viscerally engaged. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, these these Nazi-like profiteers, these doctors, mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. that are removing body parts from kids that have mental health issues. 100% of them have mental health issues that are never treated. Why? Because these doctors are in it for cash. So they don't call a double mastectomy a double mastectomy anymore. We've rebranded mm-hmm. it as top surgery. And so now we have these woke parents and others that are using these terms they don't even know, and they're fast-tracking these kids toward this kind of stuff. So you know what? Let, let's let's put it out there. People yeah. need to know. All right. So um, so if, if you are a, let's say if you are a boy, a man, a uh, you know, boy that wants to be a girl, uh, sorry, they don't want to be girls. They want to be non-binary. So um, what they've done is uh, for, for one of the procedures is that they remove the, the penis, the balls, uh, sorry, the, the testicles, the scrotum, and they, they essentially sew everything up together. Um, so you really, I'm talking like a Ken doll, like, you know, that type of a, a thing. Um, when I look at the pictures, it's actually not clear to me how this patient is able to urinate. Um, it, it's, it's, I have no idea. Uh, some of the other procedures that they perform is um, you can see that the, um, the, the, the vagina itself is preserved, but they um, have kind of almost stuck on a neophallus on top of that. Um, In other words, a fake uh, penis. They create a fake penis. Yes, for but girls. ordinarily, yeah. So ordinarily, when one is to try to obtain this surgery, this um, what they call phalloplasty surgery, they they generally remove kind of everything else. Like there's no more, um, you know. They they were, you know, it, it, it's kind of um, just that procedure and that procedure only. You know that they're, but, but what they're doing is they're preserving a a cavity. Um, you know, not the preserving the 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 vaginal canal, uh, but they are kind of sticking on a. It's basically just if I was to go there and I was to say I've drawn up some surgical plans, let's give it a go. Um, the the pictures that I see um, are not um, congruent with humans. Um, it's not automatically recognizable as uh, as a as human parts anymore. Um, and quite frankly, it makes the traditional vaginoplasty, which is the penile inversion to create a cavity, it makes it look um, almost like gorgeous in comparison to this gender nullification surgery, um, which is supposed to be like the future. And, and let, let's just talk a little bit about those numbers. And let's actually get back to Planned Parenthood for a second, because Planned Parenthood is incredibly, incredibly obsessed um, with, um, you know, Planned Parenthood is utterly obsessed uh, with um, non-binary identities. Uh, over the last few years, they have completely forgotten uh, what their core purpose was, which was eugenics. Um, and now uh, they, um, y- you know, I mean, l- the mighty can fall. Okay, I, Planned Parenthood was never mighty, but like Amnesty International, for example, went on this infamous campaign to legalize and legitimize so-called sex work. Um, and it would, they were represented by all of these pimps and pornographers. And despite the protests of abolitionist women who survived the sex trade and were, con- you know, begging them to reconsider. So, um, Planned Parenthood in 2015 had one or two pages on trans identities, and you know they were they were very uh, kind of. It wasn't very expansive. It, there wasn't a lot of stuff on it. But now you have um, entire segments of the Planned Parenthood um, website that is based simply um, to this particular uh, medical population. So Planned Parenthood have rebranded themselves. Um, you know, before they used to tell that kind of infamous lie that they were women's rights activists or whatever. Now they're actually an LGBT organization. Um, and it's not because they care about the lives of gays or lesbians, because they do this because it's driving business. Planned Parenthood 
in five years has managed to corporate rebrand themselves to create a new group of customers for itself and its website. Um, and all of the language around that is reflect is a reflection of that. Um, Planned Parenthood is unrecognizable today. So on their website, there's 178 mentions of the word trans and non-binary, yet four mentions of pap smear, 15 mentions of cervical smear. There are 38 mentions of the term non-binary, 30 mentions of the term breast exam, and the, the, within the LGBT health section, there are 30 mentions of the word lesbian, but 45 mentions of testosterone. There are more mentions of the word non-binary um, and trans, which is 300, than there are of the word woman. Okay, so what they're doing is Planned Parenthood is essentially weaponizing medical identities and they're duping good people um, who don't understand this organization um, into believing that they're an organization for women's reproductive health and they're trading on that good name um, to provide uh, this predatory science denying business of gender identity which really really hurts teens um, and they know exactly what they're doing because Planned Parenthood is forced to release every two years um, their uh, like they do like this kind of LG sorry they do this trans um survey and it's a really massive survey it's like 25,000 um uh teens uh, uh so it's 25,000 teens and from their last um one from from their last actual um uh, survey that they did uh, a shocking 91 percent were female or as they said assigned female at birth so they're totally aware of what, what's going on. And they've been aware of it for at least four years. I wanted to find ways of dealing with my gender issues that aren't medically transitioning. And those ways weren't presented to me. The only solution that was presented was chopping your breasts off, injecting yourself with hormones, and becoming a man. A lot of what drove me to transition in the first place was linked to a lot of mental health issues and a lot of stuff that I had going on. I think nobody in the medical or psychological field ever tried to dissuade me to, to offer other options. The fact that I was so obsessed, this should have been some sort of red flag to someone somewhere. There were all these red flags and I honestly wish that somebody had pointed them out to me and then I might not have transitioned in the first place. How many of you feel that you were blindly affirmed? I didn't get enough pushback on transitioning. I went for two appointments, and after the second one, I had like my letter to go get on cross-sex hormones. Two visits? That's it? And the therapist that I found um, only required one therapy session in order for her to be comfortable writing this letter for me. Um, the therapist that I got, uh, she actually told me that she could get me all the paperwork that I needed to transition that after my first session. But I mean, I mean, of course, hindsight, because I mean, back when I wanted to take hormones, I mean, I thought Planned Parenthood, oh, my God, this is like a godsend. I mean, I don't have to go because I didn't want to talk to a therapist. Um, I mean, so I, I don't have to jump through any hoops. I don't have to do anything. Um, I just walked in and got it. Um, and now... I see that they're they're really wanting to get rid of this idea of trans men, trans women, and all of that nonsense language, and they're wanting to push this non-binary. They're really obsessed with it, and their materials are reflective of that. Alex, let me. Uh, I want to. I want to take another running start at that, so people really, really begin to understand. And if people don't understand <laughs> that behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. that there is a strategic plan. They're going to mm -hmm. miss all of what we're going to talk about. These mm -hmm. things are all tied together. 
a lot of different special interests, but unless you see the, the big picture, you're not going to see how these special interests fit in and what their niche is and what they are doing. So mm -hmm. again, mention about the former CEO of Tumblr, and Tumblr was a social media site. As a matter of fact, in the pieces that I've put together, it is amazing how many uh, detransitioners reference as they're talking mm -hmm. about what got them into thinking about trans and before they ever uh, talk about being trans, as they all give their stories. I haven't found an exception yet, and I've looked through hundreds of these detransitioner mm -hmm. story, and people can go online, and these detransitioners mm -hmm. will post, uh, kind of walk people through. Inevitably, they will talk about what, uh, how they got into thinking and therefore acting as if they were trans and the medical mm -hmm. procedures they may or may not have undergone, whether social transitioning or the medical end of things. But I haven't mm -hmm. found an exception. There are two things that are always, always in play. The, uh, the social media influence, and then pornography. And so Tumblr, I had never heard of Tumblr until listening to some of these transitioners. And inevitably, virtually 100% mm -hmm. of them, they talk about, they even use their, vo their facial expressions. They say, well, I heard about it on Tumblr. So it's like, what is this Tumblr? So I started to look into this, and then that's when you and I uh, started interacting, and you referenced the CEO of Tumblr, who is now with Planned Parenthood. So talk about, I mean, perfect target marketing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so when the CEO of Tumblr joined the board of Planned Parenthood, he ran this very expansive campaign, a corporate rebranding of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood in 2014, 2015, it wasn't a particularly interesting organization for young people. Um, you know, it was sort of like an establishment, you know, healthcare provider, whatever, however you want to, you know, spin that. Overnight, ha and ha a hashtag was created called Tech Stands with PP. Uh, Tech Stands of Planned Parenthood, which ran all the way through Tumblr. Um, and they rebranded themselves to have their, you know, from their traditional Planned Parenthood messaging uh, to, to changing it to this pink lettering. And their slogan went to being, at Planned Parenthood, we are pro you. Uh, and with, so... The CEO of Tumblr, or you know, is, is completely aware that on his social network there are toxic, um, uh, toxic communities, and there always have been, especially around teenage girls. Like teenage girls, they're the ones that are into self harm. They're the ones that are into anorexia, and he very much knew that there was a big, big, big population. And what of, is his name, Alex? What is the his name? His name is David Carf. David Carf, yeah. Um, so he, he joined the board of, of Planned Parenthood um, and he, I, 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 w I went to a lot of their webinars during this time and the, their language was just astounding. They started talking about uh, cis privilege, uh, which is apparently cis privilege is um, if you are born and you don't think you're born in the wrong body, then you experience a form of privilege, and that's called cis privilege. Um, and they also uh, said that in, in one of their webinars, their training webinars for their employees, that they believe that the fact there's only two options on birth certificates, male and female, um, they, they kind of said this was a great injustice that will change very soon with the recognition of additional sexes. Um, so Planned Parenthood is a medical health provider teaching children that there are more um, than, than, than two sexes. So I don't know how we can really have fallen um, so far 
And they want to introduce this entirely new term called genderism, which is apparently oppressing someone on the basis of their gender identity, which is doing something like saying sex is not assigned at birth. Um, so this is all being disseminated through, uh, this nonsense is, is being disseminated through GLSEN. Um, so GLSEN is the organization which is disseminating the Planned Parenthood um, uh, sort of sex education. So what I'm trying to kind of get at here with, 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 with Planned Parenthood, and by the way, Planned Parenthood are not the only criminals in this. They're, they're all operating on the same model. It's almost like the opioid epidemic. You create the patients, you create the cure, right? So they are um, um, creating this whole concept of gender identity and that kids have a gender identity and that this needs to be taught in schools and that they're going to be the, the source of the education. And then they're going on and providing the solution, which is cross-sex hormones um, and referrals, uh, of course, for surgeries. So they're, they're, they have a very solid business model with this. Because when you're going into K through 12 and you're teaching them um, through GLSEN and gender spectrum um, and leveraging Planned Parenthood's good name in order to do that, you're investing in your future Planned Parenthood um, patients because they are the number one providers. So they know, they know that, that these um, mainly young girls are going to come back. It is, it is grooming. I mean, they're, they're preparing them. They're preparing them for this eventuality where if you don't feel right about yourself, you will need to come to Planned Parenthood and we will sort you out. We will give you the pill. We, you know, the, the pill to solve your gender dysphoria. We will give you the, we will give you the injections. We will give you the solutions. They're putting themselves up there um, in this way. Alex, this is where you and I started to converge and interact online. Mm -hmm. Um, from a clinical therapeutic perspective, I can assure anyone this did not exist prior to the year 2005. Now, of course, the perps and perp apologists, uh, trans pushers will say, well, it was suppressed. It was always under the surface. It didn't have a chance to come forward. My response to them is, so prior to the year 2005, all clinicians and all great theorists and all esteemed psych uh, psychiatrists and all medical schools and all decent graduate schools in psychology, they all got it wrong. We all got it wrong. Those of us that had worked for years with uh, severely emotionally disturbed kids, it had never, ever, ever come up. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Or could it possibly be that this has been manufactured and good people, Alex, like you, like me, like others, are saying, wait a second, this is a grand ruse. This is manufactured. This does not exist but for strategic planning, strategic marketing, because there are special interests that want a piece of this pie. And so together, whether big pharma, whether medical providers, Nazi-like medical providers, my biggest concern because of my background dealing with predators and dealing with survivors is what few people understand is the more a man gets into dark deviance through porn and 100% of sex offenses, 100% without exception, are uh, the perpetrator is steeped in porn prior to offending and 100% of all pedophiles, 100%, are arrested with, for possession of child porn, about 98 to 99% for the distribution of it. You won't find any exceptions as far as possession of uh, child porn. So the further a man goes into deviance, the more his tastes start to trend downward because he develops an appetite for not just traumatizing, but defiling. So power and control comes first. That's the BDSM kink deviance. 
And then what people don't know is prior to child porn, a man will get into bestiality. That's the dirty little secret that they don't want people to know because they can't control the narrative then and all sympathies go away for this ruse of what's mm -hmm. called non-offending pedophiles, virtuous pedophiles, minor attractive persons. Those are all made up right. psychological mm -hmm. ruse. So if, if a perp can get a kid on puberty blockers, the child, as they are growing though, they stay young. And the term that every sex offender understands and they educated me on is the concept, and there's actually a magazine called Barely Legal. Mm -hmm. And the more into deviance a man gets, he wants the victims younger and younger looking. And that's why you see certain women dressing up as baby dolls. And then uh, some of them want young kids dressing up as like age eight or nine. But look at the... Um, Toddlers and tiaras. The dirty little secret that no researcher would know on the street is this, that behind the scenes on the cell blocks, when that program comes on, guess who has front row seats in the block TV? Right? The other yeah. sex offenders would dime these guys out saying, Mr. Euler, I can't stand it. Do you know what these guys, your star pupils that, that act the best in, in group because pedophiles know how to act the best. Do you yeah. know what they're watching on their TVs? We see it. And so Planned Parenthood and all the uh, puberty blockers for the pedophiles, if one happens to get pregnant, now this was part of the trans push, right? Where do the mm -hmm. perps take them? And there's no questions asked. No, uh, Don't ask, mm -hmm. don't tell policy. But now mm -hmm. they can get these kids and they're targeting foster kids who are troubled, who've already been sexually perped on, who have a difficult time with boundaries, and the same thing, quite frankly, for kids with on the autism spectrum, who have a difficult time with their intuition, intuition, they make easy targets to cross their sexual boundaries. So if you can keep a kid looking younger, longer, and delay their puberty, now you can perp on them longer. And that's why the perp apologists love what's going on at Planned Parenthood because they can get these kids on puberty blockers, then begin grooming and perping on them without any fear that they're ever going to be busted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but um, for, for me, what's been so eye opening is actually seeing so many FTMs um, in pornography um, and where I see them being groomed into being pornographers or being their own pornographers is through OnlyFans. Um, so I, I kind of, what I, what I, what I say, or, or the way that I describe it is I say, um, OnlyFans prostitution, uh, and go fund me is just the intersection of exploitation. Uh, so now, Alex, what again, I've done... Uh, yeah, for, for parents or somebody that doesn't know, because I'm late in the game with OnlyFans. Mm. Describe what OnlyFans is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so OnlyFans, or rather Only Exploitation, that's what I call them. Um, it, it's sort of like peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, sharing for nudes. So um, the, the people who are promoting uh, OnlyFans are actually quite wealthy celebrities um, who are selling, you know, their kind of nude photos. Uh, often they're not nude. It's just like a bikini photo. And, and they're like the top echelons of, you know, OnlyFans, right? they're making quite a lot of money from this. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of like the Facebook of Pornhub. Okay. So you're developing a one-on-one -on -one connection with your pornographer, right? So if I was to open up an OnlyFans today, what would happen is I would tell people, okay, my name's Alex. I'm going to, you know, I've got this type of content, uh, these types of pictures or whatever, whatever, whatever. And then I'm going to get talking to my fans or my subscribers and they can ask me for anything. They can say to me, I'd like pictures of your feet. I want pictures. I mean, it's never pictures of your feet. It's always you know, the degrading, the depraved, 
um, things that they're asking for. And, um, you know, I, I just want to paint you the picture of the average person, the average FTM, the average girl who thinks she's boy um, on, you know, OnlyFans. So, you know, I, I use this example of this mythical person, Darius. Um, so your typical trans man on OnlyFans is desperate for money. When lockdown came and porn shoots were closed, she made a video of herself filleting and simulating sex with a skeleton. She appeared in various other disturbing vid videos, mainly performing blowjobs. Her tiny frame, not even five foot, appears in amateur homemade pornography where a chunk of her earnings will go to OnlyFans um, and private Snapchat. Uh, and... Only fans are basically pimps, you know, they are taking a cut of these girl, this girl, these women's exploitation. Um, and the average income for a girl on uh, OnlyFans is $170, but many make absolutely nothing. You know, many make absolutely nothing. Um, and what strikes me as being more sinister is that there are elders in the FTM community. Uh, for example, there's a, a self-declared gender-critical trans man and pornographer who goes by the name of Buck Angel. So it's the woman who waxes lyrically about how she wants to protect women, protect girls from medicalization. But she's producing content um, that encourages more and more confused and desperate young women to consider a life of pornography as a viable option. I want you to imagine a seedy motel, a woman visibly disgusted, she's 60 years old, a woman visibly disgusted by the sex act she's forming. This is the quintessential face of FTM pornography. This is what is, is out there. Um, and I've seen this individual, Buck Angel, be, be, be platformed by Christian organizations, uh, by radical feminist organizations, by, you know, people who would consider themselves to be totally and utterly against all of this. And I think that that has been the work of slowly, um, um, you know, grooming everybody else around you know, uh, uh, this, I mean, this is someone who is interviewed by Megan Murphy. This is, you know, this is someone who's been interviewed by several, um, organizations that would say that the medicalization and exploitation of, of children is disastrous, but yet there's a pornographer on their board of directors. You know, I can't seem to make that, that connection in, in my head as to why this is okay. And by the way, anybody who thinks that I'm kind of exaggerating this, please go to the Gender Mapper website where you will see pictures that I've put up of this damaging, horrific pornography because you have to see it for yourself. It's not just enough for me to tell you how horrific it is and how, and how much it makes you dysphoric. Um, and, and, and how much this is a top, this is a, a top down industry, right? We have uber rich only fans who have pop ups for Planned Parenthood, who have pop ups for um, Latina abuse, which is a website where, um, you know, Hispanic women are forced to eat out of dog bowls whilst being, uh, whilst having racist abuse shouted at them, right? This is what we're dealing with here. Um, and if you're a parent of like a teenage girl and you think, oh, this is harmless, this is not a big deal, go on there and take a browse. Take a look around, see what your daughter is doing, see what her friends are doing. See the reality here because putting your head in the sand and just saying, oh, this is not going to happen or this isn't real, go out and see for yourself because it's a hundred times worse than what I could ever describe. Well, we'll have to bring this portion of the interview to a close with Alex Aaron, but be sure to join us for the continuation of the interview as Alex goes into additional detail about the ways in which unethical and greedy medical professionals are using vulnerable 
gender-confused minors as a way to get rich, and she'll help us understand the role pornography is playing in grooming minors into the trans movement on the next edition of the Predator Watch podcast. You've been listening to Predator Watch, dedicated to shining the light of truth about the nature of the most sophisticated of sexual predators most likely to target places where victims are most easily accessed. For John Euler and the entire team, thanks for listening. Predator Watch has been sponsored by SurvivorSupport.net. As a nonprofit organization, Survivor Support is dependent upon the generosity of people who believe in its mission of supporting survivors. Please consider becoming a monthly supporter of this important work.